So welcome everybody to today's live streamed event on this World Mental Health Day, the 10th of October, 2023. Uh, today we have gathered four inspirational speakers who will candidly open up and share their insights, experiences and perspectives on how our youth and particularly our emerging adults of today, our future leaders, how they are really and truly feeling and doing out there. And we're really happy today to be joined by you, our listeners, our audience of over 100 registered uh, people from more than 20 countries around the world. Uh, and we hope that you leave today's discussions with some new learnings, insights and ideas. But hopefully, mostly, we hope that you leave today feeling like that there actually are, are solutions out there for the mental health challenges that we are facing and especially that our emerging adults are facing today. We want you to leave here feeling that you can be part of the solution. Uh, and our discussions today are powered by Nordic Talks, and hopefully you will be able to enjoy this discussion once again in podcast format in the future. So stay tuned to that. So my name is Sophia Breitholtz and I am the CEO of Reach for Change. Uh, Reach for Change is a global not-for-profit that supports early stage uh, local social entrepreneurs, uh, building their capacity and helping them to uh, sort out the most pressing issues that children and youth are facing today. But today I'm here as your moderator for this Nordic talk uh, and I'm very happy to be here with four very inspirational guests who will share their experiences on the current mental health crisis that we are facing and especially the experiences uh, and so around solutions that can support emerging adults. Um, so I'm going to turn to my guests now that I have uh, with me. Uh, first, I'd like to start with Annika. Now, Annika has over 25 years of leadership experience from management and communications within retail, telecom, consumer industries, but she then shifted focus. Um, and today she has not only coming here with the experience of uh, being a CEO of a not-for-profit mental health clinic in New York City, but also as founder and partner of the Inner Foundation. And the Inner Foundation seeks to invest in solutions that can improve mental health and also increase diversity. And Annika, you're also a very avid scuba diver and kayaker. So uh, looking forward, let's see if we have some time to dive into that as well. Uh, but today I would like to ask you uh, to consider also besides that introduction, uh, what support did you feel that you needed as a young adult that you didn't get? Uh, thank you, Sophia, for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about this subject that I so highly uh, care about. So what would, what would I have needed? Well, I'm brought up in the 60s in, in, in Uppsala, uh, a town north of Stockholm. And in my family, it was a lot of talk about physical health, but never really touched, we touched about mental health or inner health. And uh, there was not really a language introduced to us or to me regarding my inner health. And as a person that are really, I would really have needed that. I am, uh, I'm adopted and I uh, brought up in a family with two of us was adopted and two of us was uh, biological uh, siblings. And um, in the 60s, you don't really talked about that. It was perceived to be very normal, sort of. And uh, Thank God I, uh, 
and during say that like, like, like this during my teens and my uh, emerging adult years i was really struggling and having a really hard time and my support came from what i like to call my extended family from my network outside the family that could have been my football coach amazing teacher her name was begitta or uh, friends that I really connected to and I were able to sort of be both vulnerable and ask for help sort of outside my 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 family of origin and that was for me life saving uh, during those really hard years so the lack of language in my family and the lack of language in society I think I mean it was much more stigma during those years yes that's what I would have needed thank you Thank you so Annika. Um so thank you so much and also for being uh, very candid and opening up about also your your um inner inner challenges right away. I think it's getting our conversation off to a great start. I'd love to turn to Sabad now. Um now Sabad, uh, you have been working as a youth ambassador for the not-for-profit Fridesuset in Sweden for some quite ta- uh, time now. But you also have experience as an assistant nurse, a support person for SOS Barnbyar, uh, a soccer coach, and you are currently studying to be a social worker. So uh, already a very extensive CV. Um, I wanted to turn to you and also ask you to reflect a little bit um, on what you have ne- would have needed as a young adult that you didn't get. Uh, thank you. I would say shortly that what I actually needed was like uh, more support from school and uh, more counselors and nurses and special educated teachers that were able, um, both in secondary school but also in, in primary, uh, high school, both of them. So uh, teachers and adults that actually could recognize when a youth or a child is going through something and when something is not right so that was the support I wish I needed but also a community that worked and understood what a mental health is and I grew up in one of Europe's segregated cities and in a suburb area and I felt that no one actually talked about what mental health and mental illness is and like how to deal with it and being vulnerable together. So that's the support I wish I had and needed. And I am trying to work uh, with that in my community now um, and just trying to break the stigma when it comes to mental health and mental illness. So again, more able teachers, more able uh, school counselors and with right education and coaches. Like I used to play football when I was young and uh, and there was like my coach couldn't see like through you know then identify that so yeah more right education adults with right education so that's it thank you thank you sabat and uh, i i already feel that we're getting into some of the solutions here so you set us off very nicely um my third guest today is anna um now anna uh, has over 15 years of experience working with individuals couples families Not only are you a licensed therapist, psychologist, and a member of several professional associations, but you have your own private practice, um, as well as managing uh, the psychological support program for LGBTQ plus people at uh, the social enterprise Single Step in Bulgaria. So you've also worked closely with with social entrepreneurs and and the the groups that they support. So. Uh, great to have you here and in addition I've learned you're a great dog lover so we have that in common and <laughs> nice to hear that um, but I would love to hear your reflections Anna uh, on on what you felt that you needed that it would have needed but you didn't get as a young adult thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation it's a pleasure for me to be here Um, when I was thinking about that question, uh, actually, I had an answer that was formulated during um, a run, a 5K run that I was having on Sunday. So I was running, jogging, and I was like, okay, so what did, what was the thing that I didn't get when I was growing up and I would have liked to, to have? Um, and I actually, it, it has to do something with jogging, but I will come to that also. So I was a teen a teen and a young adult in the 90s in Bulgaria, which was a post during the 90s. It was just after the collapse of the socialist regime. Uh, And there was a whole generation of parents uh, for whom this was 
a total chaos. So my parents, they had professions, they, they were journalists, but all of a sudden they were left without any stability, any security. My parents were working um, just just to survive um, uh, selling vegetables and fruits on, on, the, on the market. Um, and you can imagine that um, having such a chaos in the social system and of course in the family unit, not only for me, but for a whole generation of, of kids like me, we were left to survive on our own on the streets. So we were, I mean, I've never had a parent who was actually, who knew what was I learning, uh, what was happening at school. They were very preoccupied with their own struggles and mental health struggles actually, but no one was talking about that. So there was no safe space, I would say, for us teens. Uh, we had to stick uh, together um, as a group and belong to a community of, you know, our peers. Um, definitely, I, if I was a kid um, uh, and experiencing that and something I could do differently would be that if there was a support system for me, uh, at school or uh, if there were any teachers that were involved with us or if there were any extracurricular activities um, that we could kind of develop in that would have been great but that was something that was missing so going back to the jogging and I will finish with that is that is that I actually started jogging at that particular time there was you didn't need much I mean it wasn't expensive you could go out and just put put on a sneakers and and just start running. So that was my safe space, let's say. And that's something that actually I am still doing. So there was something nice out of it, I guess. Thank you, Anna, for, for sharing that. Um, now I'd like to turn to Henrik, who's our final and fourth guest for today. Uh, Henrik graduated as a clinical psychologist in Australia. Uh, you have been running your own private practice, from Bangkok to Norway, uh, but you're also the founder of the uh, uh, organization or the company Brave, um, a platform created by psychologists which offers a variety of psychological support programs. Uh, and not only have you provided sports psychology also, right? Uh, you are an avid skier, as I've understood, and um, have worked with the national teams. Uh, but uh, as I said, you also understand to have the, the professional professional skiing background. So it's interesting. I'm seeing a red thread of, of good sportsmen <laughs> as well uh, here on, uh, on the call. But uh, as an impact entrepreneur, Henrik, uh, it's nice to have you here. And I would love to ask you the same question as we've asked the other guests, what you felt that you would have needed, but you didn't receive uh, when you were a young adult. I think you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> I guess it, thank you for that introduction and for letting me be here and speak about this as well. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and I think what already back then, bullying and violence and fighting and during adolescence, even drugs, was a big challenge. And I think me as a young person, I would really have benefited from someone facilitating discussions around how do we actually behave towards each other to create an environment which is safe and inclusive. Uh, I grew up with two older brothers. Um, and for me, fighting became a coping strategy that I wish I used less and maybe also was less dependent on. So I think that it, like everyone else has said as well, it wasn't anywhere to turn when it came to mental health um, challenges or we didn't really get an introduction to how do we talk about emotions, how do we understand our own mental health and mental health challenges. And that I think is something that pans all the way into why I became a psychologist where I was um, really bad at competing. Uh, I didn't know the mental skills that I needed to perform well. So that was my um, way in. But definitely when working with teams and working with uh, with youth, it's, it's great when you get uh, a common understanding with the group and the youth can take ownership of how do we want to behave towards each other and what is acceptable, what do we confront and where do we turn when we need help. 
Thank you, Henrik. Uh, so thank you everybody for being really candid. I think you've set the stage to of, of a lot of the uh, the solutions that I think we already uh, know that we need, right? Uh, but now let's let's look at the current state of affairs uh, where we're at today. And I'm I'll, I wanted to delve into a very large large topic, which what does the current mental state uh, or state of affairs for, for mental health look like today in the Nordics? Um, you know, do we have we have we sorted out some of these things? Do we have better support in schools? Do we have our safe spaces? Do we have the language to express these things? Um, Henrik, let's let's stay with you. Uh, can you share with us a little bit of a panoramic uh, view how how you view things right now? Uh, what what are our systems doing and what are they not doing right? I think if we if we if we start at the top, I think that we have uh, reimbursement models within mental health care, uh, which either you have a fixed reimbursement to provide care to a set population, like say within the munis municipality, or we have reimbursement models to get reimbursed for the number of activities a uh, provider completes. And I think neither of these reimbursement models really put the, enough emphasis or any emphasis on what is the effect or the effectiveness of the care we provide. And I think we really need to change that. We need to measure what works. We need to measure what doesn't. And we need to gather information of how um, we can learn so we can improve. When it comes to youth, I think many social entrepreneurs, brave included, want to contribute to solving the growing mental health challenges. But one common challenge is that there are seldom a buyer for the services targeting youth once they're ready. Many social entrepreneurs regrettably have to change their focus and move into the private sector or employee mental health and insurance uh, sector and so on. So I think we need some initiative. Okay, we can stop there maybe and we can get back to it at the later stage when we come to solutions. Thanks, Henrik. I think what I'll do is let Annika uh, respond to that. I mean, Annika, you've seen a lot of innovations and invested in both impact entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs. Um, I mean, what's what's your view of the current trends? What, what are the problems we're facing? Well, I, I would like to start with like a little bit of zooming out. I mean, we that live in the Nordics, uh, we have for a long time been perceived as sort of the happy Nordic. Uh, and there's no doubt that living in the Nordics are a good place to be. However, increased awareness around the actual stage of well-being has been more and more obvious. And I think in a way, uh, thanks to uh, COVID, some of this uh, situation has been coming up to the surface. Uh, because mental struggles can strike without mercy to all of us, but it is important to recognize that the challenges with mental health issues are distributed unevenly in our society. In the Nordics, we have some of the highest rates of mental health suffering among emerging adults, for example. It's actually, if you compare it to other European countries, we are really on, on you know, burst out. Um, and there are statistics showing that the emerging adults are twice as likely as the rest of the population to, to suffer from depression. Um, and then you can add other, you can add factors of minority, status, sexual orientation, socioeconomics, gender, climate, and intergenerational trauma and the, the the suffering is like really multiplies. So I think it's um, it's clear that uh, well, you know the public health system that Hendrik is also talking about doesn't really have the enough capacity, flexibility, or even innovation to solve all this. But I also think that it's really imp important for us as societies to start thinking that the public healthcare system are the one supposed to solve this because it's not. I mean, it might be a medical problem, but it's certainly not the solutions are not going to be sort of found within the public health system alone. And uh, I really um, appreciate the WHO's definition of, of, uh, of, of uh, mental health. And I'm not going to read it all, but I would like to state that a state of well being in which a person can recognize his or her own strength, cope with normal life pressure work productively and contribute to society, 
This definition highlights that mental health care is important, not just for individuals, but also for the entire community. Uh, and then it also becomes clear, I think, that the responsibility is sort of on all of us. Uh, and again, it, this, the solutions are not going to be found within the mental health care system alone. Uh, so when we discuss the system, I'm not always sometimes certain about what we actually discuss and what that means. Um, I mean, it's clear that the public uh, system has a layer of imperfections, but many of them are actually also being addressed. But I believe we need to focus a lot more on the whole ecosystem surrounding us. It means that when we're looking into solutions, it has to be, first of all, it's about individual, family, society at large that we are addressing. But we need to look at the ecosystem, meaning the public sector, the private sector, civil society. It is sort of everything that sort of surrounds that, that I would call the ecosystem. And uh, I mean, easy to say, but uh, the need for multi-sectoral or multidisciplinary approach, which everybody is talking about, must not only be recognized, but we really have to start acted or act upon that. Meaning, as you were starting to say, Sophia, in our role as an investor into mental health for emerging adults specifically, and we are working with what we call a blended finance model, meaning we support an, uh, both for-profit uh, innovative entrepreneurs, but also non-profit. And for us, that's really important to build on both sides because there's a lot of similarities and they could actually support one another to sort of be part of this ecosystem. Because we're not looking for one solution, we're looking for many solutions. This is not the one size fits all problem at all. I think I stopped there and we can come back to more of a solution driven uh, discussions in a little while. Thank you. Thank you, Annika. Uh, Sabat, I, I want to turn to you because Annika is talking about an ecosystem with lots of different actors. Uh, what we oftentimes see, though, is that the voice of emerging adults is not present in that ecosystem. Uh, so what what are your thoughts on this? Uh, my thoughts, I uh, think for the question, but I think my thoughts are landing on the healthcare system, which is like often is a long queue when it comes to like uh, uh, both children and youth as country. And this may be the reason why like more and more children and young people feel worse and sometimes sadly commit suicide. Um, but fortunately, like, I feel like <clears throat> we, we are still making progress, but it's being, it's, it's going slowly, as you said, is we need to like solutions, more solutions. And I feel like through, for example, through social media, people are being um, vulnerable and, people are normalizing rather than ignoring conversations around mental health. But I would like to mention how the the education market is actually part of and part of the youth and children's um well being and affect that. Um because the current situation is like I think society also puts a lot of demandings um and yeah that is um first the education obviously are placing a lot of um, expectation can that can sometimes feel impossible and difficult to achieve. Uh, for example, in Sweden, we have uh, the national test. And I think that can be like, that can feel that it's hard to achieve goals that are supposed to, everyone is supposed to do and a, t a big test, the national test. And that is that you have to take um, and do that test several times during their schooling. This affects their well-being and also their self-esteem because they may feel that they cannot cope with society's demands and and sometimes as i said before that can be the price of their well-being and the problem is here again is that youth and ch children and youth doesn't have uh, mental health uh, on their school schedule and often folks is on like as um as um and named before that it's on the physical health and through PE and that and we often forget the, how important it is to, with the mental health and teach youth and and young people how to actually express themselves because focus often on the material things and I feel like 
it's it's still taboo when it comes to my community to like speak and talk about mental health and that part and we need like more tools and and just and you know make more to make things more clearly how to like um take care of your mental health as a youth and young people um young person and we need like um digital platforms but i feel like it's not for everyone and you don't know if you don't know why how you are feeling and what you are going through going through and haven't learned that in school it can be hard to express yourself and understand what you're going through and the and i feel the mental health system is actually um it's it's a lot of it come it's it's um yeah I would say I will pass. Thank you, Saban. Well, you've highlighted a lot of the the um, uh, the events in also the lives of emerging adults, where also more more support is needed and and more 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 dialogue and and safe spaces are needed. Uh, and I'm curious uh, your your reflections here, listening also to the Nordics, but also thinking about your experience from Bulgaria, and also your experience in actually supporting people who are working with with young adults who are facing stigma uh, every day. Uh, what's your take on, on, on where we're at today with the mental health situation? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's a whole different world uh, when I listen to, to my colleagues. Um, I'm practicing in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, um, I'm also working with um, people from different countries, of course, Bulgarians who are living abroad, but, but anyway, the majority of the people that I work with are, are living in Bulgaria. And one of the main issues that we are facing here in terms of mental health um, system is that there is no law regulating the framework of psychologists and therapists working in Bulgaria. So you can imagine that this is a whole different level of system error um, when anybody can call themselves a psychologist, a psychotherapist. And there is no one who can regulate that and actually um, ask their accountability for whatever they're providing as, as services. That's one of the main issues that we are facing. There are many attempts to have such a law but for some reason uh, for many many years it has not happened so i hope that it will happen in in the near future because we do need as uh, let's imagine a person who needs psychological support and they need to find a professional who is licensed and who can provide that support you have you know the 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 system is flooded with people who call themselves psychologists and psychotherapists, but they're not licensed to provide this support, which is very, very dangerous. The other issue that we are facing is that the um, psychological, psychotherapeutic um, support is not provided in any way by the social system, so it's not affordable. Many people cannot afford to go to a therapist. Uh, let's say that the psychiatric help is maybe the only the only aspect of mental health support that is covered by the state but if you want to go to a psychotherapist um, maybe your company can reimburse you if you're working in a huge company and they can provide five sessions that they can pay for uh, but then you're on your own and that's only a minority of people that can that work in such a such a network that can that is focused on their mental health the majority of people, um, if they want to see a, a psychologist or psychotherapy, they need to find one and it will be in private practice. There is no regulation on the fees that you, you pay. Uh, so you can really not complain anywhere. And the third pillar that I want to discuss today is that um, because, as Sophia said, I'm working with, um, in, as a part of Single Step, I'm uh, working to provide um, affirmative support for LGBTQ people in Bulgaria, youth in, in particular. And one in third of these uh, teens or these young adults, when they come to my office, they have had a very, very negative experience with a psychologist or psychotherapist, or at least someone who has called themselves like that 
who has tried to cure them, to provide conversion therapy in, in some way, who has pathologized their diverse sexual orientation or gender identity, which is a huge, huge problem. And, and it's, this type of practice can push someone to suicide. And it's, and it's something that has happened. And when we talk and discuss the action points later on, I will say what are the things that we are doing to um, kind of develop uh, a different uh, ecosystem in, in that perspective. Oh, I would love to add something uh, in there, if it's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, please, go, yes, go ahead. Yeah, please. I would, I would yeah. say that um, you mentioned that it's sometimes about the economy part that you have to like, um, if you want to search for help, that part. And I, I agree with you that one, because um, it can be hard to, you know, have uh, um, as a youth, you don't have maybe enough uh, um, accommodation or um, economic, and it can, it's a class question, I think, here. So for, for, for the emerging adults, I feel like often they have to deal with the, the demandings from the labor market, and often they can feel like they don't have anyone they can talk about um, their, what they're going through, and how <clears throat> that the boss is maybe not talking about or the environment they are is not allowing how to take care of your mental health. So I feel like it's very important that um, as a as a worker or as a as a place as a workplace that youth actually and your emerging adults um, get the ability, you know, to to feel like they can express themselves and that it shouldn't be like when you're searching help, it shouldn't be about your, what you have in your pocket. So that's, you, you, you woke up thought in me. So that's, thank you. Thank you, Sabah. Thank you, Anna. I think it's, it's really interesting the the points of both, you know, affordability, but also access. Uh, so very, very good points. I think that leads us really nicely into, into our, our, our second question when we're really talking about the solutions there. Uh, let, let's paint the vision of, of, of the system that we want with uh, and talk concrete solutions because now we we have a good idea of the challenges that we're facing um but Henrik let's let's go to you um what what do you see in terms of of solutions for the for the future that could we could implement I think that there's there's so many perspectives here right and I think for in in some sense we are we are spoiled in in Norway and Sweden with the number of professionals we have available and the licensing bodies and so on. But as uh, Anika mentioned, it is about finding solutions that doesn't necessarily depend on those still scarce resources. Um, and also, I think as when um, Sabab, when you mentioned uh, the school system figuring out like we have collaborations with private schools in Norway sports academy primarily where we we provide teachers and students the ability to go through a program uh, where they learn about basic mental health skills and it's so good to see sort of the qualitative feedback that we get from these students to see the way that their language and their vocabulary really increases during um, or while they do that program. So how they explain the challenges in the beginning is really vague, but towards the end, they're really able to put words on what do I struggle with? Uh, what do I need help with? What is most important to me? And I think with that vocabulary in place, you you are more suited also to, to reach out and find more personalized or individual help from mental health professionals as well. So I think that putting it on, putting it as part of our education, I think that's, there are some really good solutions to do that in a really cost effective uh, way that doesn't uh, further sort of burden the, the sectors or the primary or specialist mental health care uh, units who already feel overwhelmed and where as you mentioned, the waiting lists are really long. And I think further, I think it's, it's, it is that multidisciplinary uh, 
figuring out ways of drawing on the strengths in from the different players. So if you look at uh, Scandinavia, we have a really strong scene of social entrepreneurs and tech startups who are able to build uh, new products, work together with their user groups and be very agile in how they do develop their services. And I think then the public sector is more being able to contribute with uh, funds for those initiatives where youth and tech and social entrepreneurs work together and then re figure out the way for them to to be able to to offer and scale and implement those solutions post those initial pilots because often there are pilots but then there are no funding or there's no plan for implementation and scaling which is a massive challenge which which result in us making repeated effort and sort of the tackling the problem but then it just stops we don't get to actually using it and i'm not saying that you should give and i think that back to us being social entrepreneurs is my vision and why we started brave is that we came from or i came from a place where already as soon as i started as a psychologist i saw a problem and i more started brave to solve that problem more than maybe where you see a lot of traditional entrepreneurs who to, who enter because they see an opportunity. And I think that is, uh, it's really important that people who are in this space, as you mentioned as well, Anna, there are some people who enter this place who more are opportunists. And that's not okay when you enter mental health. It needs to be, you need to be, focused on solving a problem and ensuring that whatever service you do provide are evidence-based and you can show that the initiatives we take actually have an effect. So for the public sector, I would say that allow smaller companies to work together with you, get initiatives started. Um, but then once you want to give them a freedom there, but at the same time, set clear KPIs on what you would like to see in the end product. Like what are the effects? What are the user friendliness? What are the qualitative feedback you get? And what are the quantitative measures or impact that you would like to see from these initiatives? Thank you, Henrik. And I appreciate you also bringing up this idea of us starting pilot after pilot, but not really scaling up the solutions that, that actually we see are efficient and have the potential to, to create more impact. So I think that's a good point to let maybe Annika in uh, from the investor's perspective also um, and sharing a little bit why the investors also are needed in the ecosystem together with these other actors. Right, thank you. And Henrik, yes, the, the graveyard of pilots, uh, that's what we see. And I think that's a huge challenge with the current system that we are giving funding for, for pilot or pub the public funding for pilot, but there's no really follow up, follow, follow up funding if you're actually going to scale them up. But uh, I want to start by saying that, I mean, I think we all believe that mental health are being present as one of humanity's most significant challenge. But I also, and also or maybe therefore, it's also a most one of the most, it's most significant opportunities. It may sound strange to put that out here, but I really think it is because if you how can we really as a society afford not to address this in a sustainable way? How can we, uh, I mean, how, I mean, we need to start looking at this from a much more diverse perspective. And I said it before, and I'm saying it again, it's not just like we're looking for one silver bullet here that's gonna solve all the problems. I mean, we need to be much more diverse. There needs to be many solutions out there. We know, we know actually a lot. We know a lot about the problem, I would like to say. We also know that loneliness and disconnection uh, is a really high trigger for, for mental health issues. And uh, so, yeah, so for me, it's more about uh, it's going from focusing on the problem. It's almost like the awareness is already there especially again after so post covid there's been a whole different sort of awareness about the problem we i used to say that you, we need to love the problem and and, and in, but i'm actually trying trying more thinking about we need to love uh, 
the solutions. And I'm, I'm following you, Henrik, when you say there needs to be evidence-based solution. Yes, but I also would like to say that there's a lot of solutions there, which is as long as you're focusing on outcome, and I guess that's a definition of, of how you define the uh, sort of evidence, but there are many solutions there. And I'm as an investor and as a grant giver, I see, see many, many of them. I mean, we have, as the, from the Inner Foundation, maybe seen four or 500 entrepreneurs, for-profit, non-profit, the last few years. And, and many, many of them are actually, the good ones, I would say, are taking their sort of position, which is actually community-based. What works out there? And they are really taking the strength and they sort of, everything comes from what is actually my community or this community I'm here to serve, what works for them. And it's clear that whatever solution they come up with can never live in a vacuum by itself. It needs to be connected with other players in the ecosystem. So I'm going to keep on talking about this ecosystem because I think that's the only way moving forward. So how do we connect to different solutions with one another? How do we let the public healthcare system become sort of the, the sort of the backbone of the system? Because there are like 85% of the markets in a way would come from them. They are the one that paying part sort of. But to that, we have to add the private sector. We had to have add um, the this, this civil society. And, it's, it's, uh, and we also need to invest accordingly. Because again, this could be an opportunity. This is not about healing, right? It's not about healing people that suffers. And in our focus, again, is the emerging adults. This is about the potential of having people thriving and flourishing. The upside of that. That's what we need to put in the other sort of, whatever that's in English, vog, squal, to, to really you know, make that happen. And I think the kind of conversations like this or other conversations where we cross, you know, we meet and discuss and, and putting resources and open up networks. That's the only thing. And then letting initiative come out there and flourish and take place. And some of them will fail, obviously, but there will also be a lot more coming in because again, we are looking for many solutions because there are many, many types of problems out there that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Annika. And I love that you're talking about the upside of this. I mean, if we imagine that as a vision, uh, you know, what would be the upside of having our society and our, you know, future leaders and, and uh, future em employees and future taxpayers and everybody thriving and doing really well? Uh, Anna, I'd love to turn to you uh, after listening to this conversation. You know, what kind of solutions do you see concretely? Uh, do you have some some examples? Of course, I I, uh, I feel very proud with the work that Single Step has been doing for the past well more than five years now since two seven two thousand seventeen. Uh, when we started the NGO, um, it was with the with the main goal of providing affordable. Uh, psychological support, social support for LGBTQ youth and their families. And since then, and the first thing that we actually did was to talk to these youth, to listen to what they need before we even formed the whole psychological support program. Um, that was the very, very first step that we took. Um, the first service that we provided was the online chat, which uh, is working since 2017 until today, every single evening, it doesn't matter if it's a holiday, if it's a Sunday, Saturday, Christmas, Easter, it doesn't matter, it's working. Three hours in the evening, it's free, it's confidential, it's anonymous, and it uh, and there are more than 30 volunteers who have worked on this uh, online chat for the past years. These volunteers are people who I have trained to provide the adequate um, emotional support, of course, um, that the LGBTQ youth need. Um, so this was the first step that we took, and it, it is until today, I think, the heart of all the services that we have since developed uh, in, in a single step. The second thing was to provide a free psychological uh, support for people who are um, until the age of 20. So if you're under 20, uh, you, can, you can access free psychological support for as many sessions as you need, you and your family members, because LGBTQ youth, they are probably one of the most vulnerable groups 
when we talk about um, adolescents and, and teenagers, they often feel very alone, they often feel very ashamed um, that they have no one to talk to um, and that there is something wrong with them when they, well, the, the context that they're living in in Bulgaria often provides these kind of messages that you are you might be sick, you have to be sick uh, if you are uh, with uh, a diverse sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, so this was the second step that we did. Uh, we provide until today and we have met many, many families, many, many LGBTQ youth. I do not want to, to speak in numbers because these people, each and each one of them, they, they are um, much more than a number to me and the, the uh, team members at Single Step. The next things that we did was to create psychological support groups for uh, these youth. Because as I said, one of the main issues that they were experiencing is that I don't have anyone who is going through the things that I'm going through. I need to talk to someone, a peer of mine, who can maybe share he, their experience. Uh, maybe I can learn from them. Uh, and also, if, um, as I said, their feeling of loneliness is very, very dominant. So providing such a safe space for them was very crucial. So until today, we have one in-person um, support group led by a psychologist. They meet twice per month, um, every month. We have an online group which started during the, pan the COVID pandemic, of course, um, and it covers um, all other cities outside of Sofia. We also have a support group for parents of LGBTQ uh, youth because usually when um, when their child comes up, comes out to them, uh, there are many different stages through they they go through. It, so they need support, of course, uh, which is provided in terms of psychological support. But also when they talk to another parent who has gone through that, um, they they feel less alone in in this experience. Also, and I will probably finish with that. What we what we do and what is my my personal battle let's say is that i provide trainings for mental health professionals for them to be much more equipped when they're working with lgbtq youth um, to provide affirmative care um, not what they're taught in the university system here in bulgaria which usually is very pathologizing when it comes to, to lgbtq people I, we have created a network of uh, psych psychologists in Bulgaria also who, have, who I have trained so they provide if for example someone writes uh, in the online chat and they are from a small town outside of Sofia of course somewhere in Bulgaria what the volunteer is doing of course they're providing emotional support but they're also providing the contact for example the psychologist who is the nearest to them so they can go and have a free session in person with them. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Saba, do you want to share a little bit around um, the solutions? That yeah, see? I would say um, from a youth perspective, I think that the healthcare system is not adapted for everyone, which means that like um, means that certain target groups, for example, young adults struggle with mental well-being, and it's like <clears throat> young people can often be like misunderstood and when they seek help for their mental well-being and it's due to that they don't get the knowledge in you know in school and that can be hard to like to actually understand and have the ability to understand when they express um psychosomatic symptoms such as panic attacks and or sleeping problems and it's and it's hard to like understand it but i would say another perspective and when <clears throat> Henrik mentioned the evidence-based um, knowledge. I would say this this also like that in in the healthcare system is often based on medical and uh, legal discussions, discussions, which is strong that it's like it's had it has its own language. It can be hard for the individual to sometimes understand the help they get from the doctor or the psychiatric and they can they can feel often like as a the individual can feel powerless and prevent from like seeking the help and feeling safe when they are like um, seeking help or trying to. So here I would say we need more like social actors that are 
who can like create a sense of context for young people so they can learn how to like express their feelings and understand uh, how they like <clears throat> how the system works and and because from my experience young people would appreciate this and again is to we will need like organization and or non-profit uh, activities that offered free workshops and lectures about mental health and and just to like support a community maybe and come around with the stigma and just understand and what you're going through so i would say um invite uh, invest in this uh, local in local community or in non-profit organization that actually are working with the questions and that are actually doing the great job they are doing but it ha it doesn't have to always be like the that we have to like search for other ones that i would say already if someone's making changes uh, lift that and invite the group in this um uh, areas and youth can often feel powerless Thank you, Sabad. It's great that you bring also the, the perspective of inclusiveness. Uh, we can create a need to create also inclusive languages as well as, as, as spaces. Uh, so we're starting to round up our discussions here. We've gone from, from the challenges, but also uh, have very many good concrete examples of the solutions. Uh, and so we have a bit of a roadmap of what we need to do. If I can challenge you all to take just one minute or less than one minute to talk to us about concrete action that either you will take or that the audience can bring with them to do um let's uh let's start with sabad there i would say as a, if you are a coach or if you are a teacher or if you are a family member um i would say as someone more than once if you are feeling something is not not going well or if you feel like things are not the usual way and as a coach I would say go to like education if there is available just to know how to identify when a child or a young people are going through something just for the to prevent suicide and as a family member I would say never give up uh, and seek help and have the hope to uh, support your family member and yeah thank you thank you Sabad uh, Annika. Yes, uh, thank you, Saba. I, I, I totally uh, echo that. Sort of look around. Be, be. Um, who, who can you be open for? What's going on in the surrounding? And, and, and lead with example. Be vulnerable yourself and ask for help when we need it. And others would sort of follow. Uh, in addition, I would like to take this opportunity to something that is very concrete and actually happens as we speak. Uh, I talked a lot about the ecosystem and bringing, bringing partners together. And uh, I guess I'm a little bit sort of wind up because that's actually what we're doing today. We are, uh, we meaning the Inner Foundation, uh, Tim Bergling Foundation and the Reach for Change as an implement implementation partner are launching something today that we call Next in Mind. A scaling well-being for emerging adults in the Nordics, which is actually our, um, this has been something that's been in the making for quite some time, and it's been launched today as the Mental Health Day. And uh, it is about uh, talking about, it's actually about supporting and gathering, not just us, but also a number of knowledge partners, other funding partners in the Nordics to come together and introduce an initiative that we will call out for uh, amazing entrepreneurs in the Nordics that are addressing the well-being of mental health uh, for emerging adults. And this is an incubator program for 20 plus uh, social entrepreneurs. And in addition, it's also a program where we address uh, the ecosystems and the different players within the ecosystem that this, initi this initiative takes on a role to facilitate those different actors in order to really work together. And in order for this initiative to be successful, we also doing a shoot out because even though we have a lot of people, a lot of organization supporting it for day one, which is today, we would love to see more, more organization joining 
uh, of course, to join to make sure that these, because we are so dedicated to support this bold entrepreneurs throughout their journey to uh, reshape the mental health landscape for emerging adults in the Nordics. But there would also be a need for more funding as these amazing entrepreneurs are becoming really ready to do scaling. And uh, we need more we need more resources and from all parts of, of our, our ecosystem. And um, I'm super excited that we are actually now uh, putting uh, the, this initiative into not just our heads, but actually to the to the many people. So that would be my very hands on call to action that is happening as we speak. The next in mind, scaling, scaling well-being for emerging adults in the Nordics. Thank, Thank you, you. for that call to action. Henrik. I think both Sabat and Anna, you touch on on two two aspects where I think is is super important when it comes to creating that ecosystem. You talk about Anika as well, and it's sort of both looking at peer to peer and even taking it down to uh, to individual level. How can I how can I support those around me? How do I know how to approach people who and talk to people who have they are experiencing suicidal thoughts, etc. And how can I, as a professional, equip others with less clinical experience with actually their knowledge that they need to do to support a larger group of people? And I think if we're able to use the resources we have available by creating ecosystems with different support or the right level of support at the right time, I think we'll get a long way. And it is great, Annika, that you are launching an, uh, an initiative that will bring the different players together. Thank you, Henrik. Uh, and over to Anna. Hi, I'll be very quick as I see that time is running out. What I would like to say to the audience, um, if they're looking for a mental health professional, to be very um, focused on what their license is, what, their, what group of people they're working with, what they specialize in, uh, just make your research before you go to a psychotherapist. Uh, if they're a member of a professional association, if, uh, if they have any um, other feedbacks from other clients, okay, so just, just do your research before you go to, to their office. And if there's something that you feel is wrong with how this uh, therapist is approaching you, maybe your gut feeling is, is correct and you should trust that. So thank you. Thank you to all four of you uh, inspirational speakers. I think we've had very good um, feedback on everything from uh, what we see is not working in the in the macro level, but also to very concrete call to actions, what you, the listeners, can do, uh, but also what we need to, to do and get more into, into the system to actually create these safe spaces and, and, and the um, improvements that we're seeking. So we're very keen to hear your follow-up as well and uh, how your listeners have, have enjoyed this. So we're going to present a quick Menti survey. I know it's past time, so if you need to log off, you're welcome to do that. Um, but if you do have a couple of minutes to spare, please um, go to menti.com and enter the code you see here, uh, 5, 56315378. Uh, and we would be really appreciative to have your have your feedback. Uh, especially on what is the biggest takeaway that you have from today's discussion. So we'll we'll keep this uh, uh, mentee survey up, um, but also say a very big thank you to our speakers today and to you, uh, the audience, for tuning in to us today. <laughs>